Hi, I'm Vahid Behzadon. I'm a PhD candidate in uh, the ISCOS lab working on AI safety and security under Professor Munir. Uh, and my research is focused on reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning and the safety and security aspects of which. And as it happens, today's lecture is on is going to provide an introduction on reinforcement learning. This is the first of three or four lectures on reinforcement learning or RL. And uh, it's a very interesting and involved topic. We are going to cover the basics of both the terminology and the mathematics behind reinforcement learning. And we are going to see how uh, systems or algorithms like deep reinforcement learning uh, work. You, if you follow the uh, news in AI research and development, you're probably familiar with uh, Google DeepMind's AlphaGo um, algorithm or other developments in the same lines. So these re lectures are uh, targeted towards covering how those algorithms or advancements come to work. So far, this lecture has covered supervised learning, which is uh, the type of learning where you have a set of data points and you have the correct labels for those data points. Like if you want to uh, train a model to recognize pictures of cats from pictures of dogs, you can create a training set which has pictures of cat labeled as cat and pictures of dogs labeled as dogs and you feed it to your model whose objective is to learn a function that maps that maps from the input data to the correct label examples of supervised learning are well classification regression analysis object detection uh, face recognition semantic segmentation, image captioning, and there are a lot of different examples. Um, so, uh, again, in supervised learning, it's important to note this because this comes up later. You have a supervisor, usually a human, that labels or annotates your data points. And the objective is to uh, approximate a function or learn a function that best maps from input data or uh, data points to the label. You've also learned about unsupervised learning, where you only have data points, you only have the data, you don't have any labels telling you what the data represents. And the objective or the goal in unsupervised learning is to learn some underlying hidden structure of the data. Examples of unsupervised learning are clustering algorithms like k-means clustering, dimensionality reduction, feature learning, density estimation, and so on. But as it happens, there's a third class of machine learning algorithms called reinforcement learning, or RL. Reinforcement learning is concerned with the problems where an agent is interacting with the environment, which provides some numeric reward signals, some measurable or quantifiable reward signals. Real life examples of reinforcement learning, uh, well, for those of us who have pets, you know, when you're training your pet to behave in a certain way, you give it a treat, uh, when it does what you want it to do, when the desired behavior is shown, and you uh, punish it by not giving it attention or some other means. And the uh, pet in this example, like a dog, learns how to behave to maximize the number of treats it receives and minimize the punishment. Uh, reinforcement learning has many different facets or dimensions which uh, which has been utilized in different fields, like in engineering, particularly in electrical engineering or robotics or mechanical engineering. The field of optimal control is very close to reinforcement learning. Then there is uh, in neuroscience where 
uh, huge studies have been performed on showing how the dopamine system performs the exact same or emulates the exact same mechanism by uh, providing more dopamine or producing more dopamine when something useful happens or something desired happens and producing less dopamine when something undesired happens. It is important to note that the goal of the reinforcement learning process or uh, reinforcement learning mechanism in general is to learn how to take actions in order to maximize reward. Um, in the domain of artificial intelligence, one of the good benchmarks of reinforcement learning or more specifically deep reinforcement learning, which we'll cover in uh, the last or the last two lectures, is uh, playing or learning to play Atari games. We'll talk about this in more details in a few slides. So uh, I said that reinforcement learning is a different class of machine learning, but it, that doesn't mean that reinforcement learning is mutually exclusive. So there are things in common or techniques in common between reinforcement learning and supervised learning. An example is uh, inverse reinforcement learning or uh, uh, some argue that imitation learning can also be seen as supervised reinforcement learning. That argument is, uh, well, questionable. There are debates going on on that. Um, same is true with unsupervised learning and supervised learning. We have the domain of semi-supervised learning where some data points are labeled, but not all of them. So uh, clustering algorithms are used to cluster points which are closer to label uh, a certain label point together and then run a supervised learning algorithm to train a model. Now that we know what the general topic of the day is, Let's see what we're going to talk about today. We are going to dive deeper into what reinforcement learning is. We are going to uh, talk about a mathematical framework to capture and model reinforcement learning. Uh, this math mathematical framework is called Markup Decision Process, or MDP. We're going to go over the terminology of RL, some definitions of concepts uh, or attributes within RL. We are going to uh, discuss the different categories of RL. We are going to talk about the problem of exploration and exploitation, and we are going to finish this lecture by playing a mystery game which puts us in the shoes of an RL agent to get a better sense of what uh, this RL problem is all about. So, reinforcement learning. As I said, the problem of reinforcement learning is to learn for an agent to act optimally or as optimal as possible in an environment. What does this agent observe in the environment? Well, the agent observes the state of the environment. The state of the environment are those parameters that describe the environment best or good enough for the specific task at hand. Like when you want to play uh, chess, where each piece is in the chess grid is the state of that game. I must note that what the agent observes is not always the complete, uh, a complete view of the state. So there are cases where a complete view is not available or is noisy. In those cases, there's a difference between the state and observation, but uh, for the duration of these lectures on reinforcement learning, we are going to assume that the agent observes everything from the environment. So the state is the same as the observation of the state. Well, then the agent somehow decides to perform an action within the environment. That somehow, that methodology to select the action is going to be learned by a reinforcement learning. When that action is performed, the environment provides a reward 
in a quantifiable manner. And we'll talk about this reward signal more, but it's important to note that this reward signal is a scalar value, it's a number. What else is available after the action is performed by the agent? It's a next state or uh, the state that has resulted from performing the action of the agent's action. Um, so let's talk about what makes reinforcement learning different from other machine learning paradigms like supervised learning and unsupervised learning. First of all, there's no supervisor. There's no human annotator telling the agent that what it's doing, whether what it's doing is right or wrong, or whether what it's doing is good or uh, is uh, desired or undesired. It only receives a reward signal, like that treat that you give a dog when it does something good is a reward signal, but you have to note that this feedback signal, this reward signal can be delayed. It's not necessarily instantaneous. Um, when you play the game of chess, you don't really know whether the action that you performed is good or bad. You don't know whether the move of, I don't know, playing uh, or taking the pawn uh, to uh, two spaces forward or starting with a uh, another movement is good or bad until the end of the game. So the reward signal in playing chess, the ultimate or high level reward signal in playing chess is winning or losing the game. That's how the feedback can be delayed. It is important to notice also that we're talking about sequential decision making. We're talking about making decisions over time, not just a single decision, the objective is to maximize, or in the example we talked about playing chess, the objective is to win the game. So you have to make a sequence of decisions over time as the state of the environment changes. So the data is not IID. And if you recall, IID stands for independent and identically distributed. Why is it not IID? Well, for starters, because the actions performed by our RL agent affects the subsequent data that it receives. So there is a correlation between uh, action state or next state or the previous state. Some examples of RL problems, uh, a very basic one is this card pull problem where the objective is to balance the pull on top of a movable card. What are the state parameters or the variables that describe the state? One is the angle of this pole, another is angular speed, position, horizontal velocity. What are the what is the space of available actions? It's uh, available actions is the or the action that the agent can perform is the horizontal force applied on the cart. And what's the reward? It's one at each time step if the pole is upright. Another example is robot locomotion. Remember how human children learn to walk. They start from uh, crawling and then learning to stand and then walking onwards. If you apply RL and particularly deep RL, it is possible to teach an artificial agent, be it a robot or just a simulated physical entity with joints, how to walk or how to move around using its joints or by manipulating its joints. So the example that is uh, shown in the slide is from a simulation or training performed in a a uh, physics simulator called Mojoko. Uh, in the example on our left, you see a human skeleton with, if I recall correctly, 56 joints. And the objective there is to make the robot or this skeleton to 
to move forward. Uh, what are the estate variables here? Angle and position of the joints. What are the actions available? Torques applied on joints. If you don't recall what torque is, you can Google it. It's not too difficult. But for now, you can assume that it's uh, equivalent to force. It's a little more involved than just force, but you can look it up. Uh, this is not a complicated uh, uh, topic or concept. And what's the reward signal? It's one or plus one at each time step. If the robot is upright and moves forward. The example on the right is very interesting. You can see a spider-like being uh, with four legs and multiple joints, and the objective is for this creature to learn to move around. Uh, similar examples include Boston Dynamics robotic dog. You can look up videos on it. It's very interesting that dog learns to not only move around and navigate using four legs. It's a physical robot, by the way. It's not just simulation. It also learns to cooperate with other intelligent agents uh, in the environment to perform tasks like opening a door and uh, allowing navigation for the swarm or the batch of robots, robotic dogs uh, in the environment. As we talked about this, another example, another well-known example is Atari games. Uh, this was actually one of the benchmarks or one of the earliest uh, environments or problems that was investigated during the development of deep reinforcement learning. What's the objective? Well, the objective of playing any game is to win it. So complete the game with the highest score. Like when you play Pong, uh, Pong is very much similar to ping pong. We'll look into examples of uh, Pong logic and how to develop uh, reinforcement learning for Pong. The state in deep reinforcement learning is raw pixel inputs of the game state. So there are no manually picked uh, variables or parameters like where the ball is, where the paddle is, or what your current score is, what the velocity of the ball is. The beauty of deep reinforcement learning is in combining deep learning with reinforcement learning. What's, what, what's the benefit of using deep learning? Well, deep learning allows us to do automatic or semi-automatic feature analysis. It allows us to learn what features, what parameters are of importance in the environment. And then we feed those features to the RL algorithm to learn how to behave in a complex environment. We'll go into the details of it in a couple of lectures, but it's good to have a good understanding of, a basic understanding of what deep reinforcement learning and all the hype around, this, around it is all about. So the state in playing Atari games is raw pixel inputs of the game. What are the actions available? Well, game controls like arrow keys, uh, left, right, up, down in some cases. Uh, it's uh, shoot, jump, or things like that. And what's the reward signal here? It's a score, or a score increase or decrease, a difference in score at each time step. And the famous uh, deep RL example, the game of Go, the objective is to win the game, uh, the state is position of all pieces. It's important to note that the state space for the game of Go is huge. It's very big. And uh, some in the uh, computational AI domain used to think of it as an example of practically infinitely large state space. But DeepMind's AlphaGo algorithm managed to capture how humans or how natural intelligence learns to play the game, given that they don't have complete information of all possible states, as opposed to chess. What are the actions available? Where to put the next piece down? And what's the reward signal? This is a very good example of delayed reward signal. A typical game of Go it depends on the opponent and the uh, level of skill, but 
typically takes longer than a half hour and it can even take several hours to complete, which contain which includes uh, tens or hundreds of moves by the player. So the reward signal is one if uh, the agent wins at the end of the game or zero otherwise. You can see how delayed this reward signal can be. So how can we mathematically formalize the RL problem? We've already seen that, uh, we've already seen a set of parameters involved in RL. One of them is current and the next state of the environment. Another is the action that the agent takes to interact with the environment or change the state of the environment. And another is the reward signal. Turns out that Markov decision processes or MDPs are very well suited to this RL setting. Um, so Markov decision processes are based on the assumption of Markovian property. What's Markovian property? Markovian property tells you that the current state of the environment or the current state of the system that you are analyzing completely characterizes the state of the world. And there are implications of this. One implication is the next state of the environment only depends on the previous state, not the state before. Like when you play chess, the next state of the environment depends on the previous state, which is where each piece is, plus the action taken. Is this Markovian property universal? Can it characterize everything that we see in the universe? Some argue that that's not the case. The universe is not necessarily always Markovian. Um, those who bring this argument into the domain of RL research sometimes mention autonomous navigation as a non-Markovian system. There's another argument uh, against us that says if you define the meaning of state properly or accordingly, any system in the, the universe can be transferred or transformed into a Markovian system. So now that we know what the Markov property is and uh, what Markovian systems are, let us define the MDP or Markov decision process. And MDP is defined by a tuple of five variables, capital S, capital A, capital R, capital P, and gamma. What's S? S is the set of all possible states. Like in the game of chess, it's a set of all possible configurations of pieces on the chessboard. A is a set of possible actions. What are the actions that are possible uh, at any given state? Like when you start a game, a uh, game of chess for white, it's moving pawns forward or starting with uh, uh, other pieces That's or horses. That's the state of possible actions given the initial configuration of a chessboard. R is a distribution, is a distribution or a function, depends on whether you're talking about a stochastic system or a deterministic system is a function of reward given by the state action pair. So you're in a given state, state S, and you take action A, there's a reward or instantaneous reward associated with taking action A at state S. Uh, we'll go into the details of are later on. Another important parameter in MDP is P, or the transition probability. Transition probability tells us what is the probability of ending up in state ST plus 1 if you take action AT at state ST. In a stochastic systems, in deterministic systems, Whenever you take action AT at state ST, you always end up at state ST plus one. But in the stochastic systems, 
<clears throat> you may end up at stake ST plus one with a uh, probability like 80% and 20% of the time you'll end up at another state S prime T plus one. So uh, it's, it's also got a very interesting parallel in physics, which is called dynamics. So P describes the physics or the dynamics of the system or the environment. And gamma is a discount factor and gamma is a value between zero and one and it determines how useful or how important we think future states are or or rewards or states in uh, future are. The further we go into the future in our predictive model of the future, uh, the action may become less important. We'll go into the mathematical details of gamma probably in the next lecture, but just to give you an example, you know that if you uh, if you're trading or if you're selling something, if someone gives you the purchase price right now, it's a lot more important to you than if that someone were, was to give it to you in a week. You want to make sure that you get the money now because a lot can happen between now and a week from now and the buyer or the client may decide to change their mind. This gamma, in some sense, talks about the certainty of receiving the reward. But there's more to it when we'll, we'll talk about it uh, mostly in the next lecture. So, uh, to review the RL problem within this MDP framework, let's say at time step T0, RL samples the state of the environment or the initial state of the environment S0 by observing it. Then for T equals zero until done, this is uh, a pseudocode or uh, an algorithm for a loop here. In each iteration of this loop, agent selects action AT based on some criteria. The environment samples the reward signal resulting from implementing that action in the environment. Then the environment also, or the agent also samples ne the next state, ST plus one, and the agent receives reward RT and the next state, ST plus one, as its next set of inputs. And this keeps going based on some boundary condition which we'll come to later. Now let us define something important called a policy. A policy pi is a function from S to A, from states, the, the space of all possible states to the space of all possible actions that specifies what action to take in each state. Like if you are uh, in a certain state, it tells you what the corresponding action should be. We'll go into the details of it in a couple of slides. And there's also this notion of objective. The objective of RL in most cases is to find policy pi a star. Remember that star in most cases represents or denotes optimality. So find the optimal policy pi a star that maximizes cumulative discounted reward. And what do we mean by cumulative discounted reward? Well, a basic notion of it is represented in the slide as the sum over the time horizon, which can end at infinity, or there may be a time capital T where it ends, the sum over the time horizon of weighted reward signals, instantaneous reward signals. What's that weight? It's the discount factor gamma to the power T. Remember that gamma is between zero and one. Any value between zero and one to a positive, uh, power greater than one is going to follow a decreasing trend. For example, 0.2 to the power two is 0.04. 0.2 to the power three is 
0.008. You can see how it decreases as the power of uh, 0.2 increases. And again, this idea is to show the di diminishing importance or value of uh, future rewards, the rewards that happen further in time. We'll talk about the details of this, but for now we just want to uh, learn the basics or the general overview of what cumulative discounted reward is. Now, let's talk more about rewards or instantaneous rewards. A reward RT is a scalar feedback signal. It indicates how well the agent is doing at time step t. So again, it's instantaneous. It's not cumulative. And the agent's job is to maximize a cumulative reward. Now, it's of particular importance to know about the basis or the basic assumption, the fundamental assumption of RL with respect to rewards. The reward hypothesis says that all goals can be described by the maximization of expected cumulative reward. Is that necessarily true? Well, you can think about this. You can uh, come up with your own examples and see whether that's necessarily true or not. Many believe that uh, a scalar value is not necessarily the best way to put it, but there are usually ways of mapping different dimensions of reward into a single uh, number. Like in the utilitarian point of view, uh, the objective is to maximize joy and to minimize suffering. So suffering is negative reward, joy is positive reward. Like an example is I want to finish a paper tonight, but the deadline is tonight. If I don't finish the paper, I will uh, miss the deadline and miss this opportunity to publish the paper. But at the same time, I'm very tired and I would very much like to sleep. If I decide to sleep, I will gain some positive reward by the joy that sleeping brings, but there is a bigger negative reward associated with it. In this particular case, it's not necessarily so. There is a bigger negative reward associated with missing the opportunity or missing the deadline to submit the paper. You can add these two together and see that the outcome is a negative value. So deciding to sleep is probably not the optimal solution here. So what are the major components of an RL agent? An RL problem or an RL agent may, and the keyword here is may, it doesn't necessarily, include one of these, one or more of these components. One of them is policy. We've already provided a basic definition of policy. It's the agent's behavior function, how to act given a, a certain state, or what action to choose given a certain state. Value function, how good is each state and or action? So you're in a particular state during your uh, sequential decision-making, you've reached state ST. How good is the state? This is determined by the value function. Or how good is an action? There is something called a uh, state action or uh, state action value function or the Q function, which is the basis of Q learning. We'll discuss more about Q learning in the next lecture. And it uses the, and it tells you what the value of taking a certain action in a certain state is. We'll go into the details of these in a moment. And the model represents the agent's uh, information or knowledge of the environment. So, Let's dive into the details of those concepts. We said that a policy is the agent's behavior. What is it exactly? It maps from state to action. If the system is deterministic, or if the dynamics of the system, or if you decide to go with a deterministic policy function, then you have a function which receives a certain state st as its argument and always outputs 
action 80 for that particular state. So that's what determinism means. The deterministic policy outputs the same uh, action for a certain state at any given time. But policies can also be a stochastic. So in a stochastic policies, we have a probability distribution. We say that if state ST is presented to the policy function, with probability P, action A may take place. And with probability P prime, action A prime may take place, and so on. So there is a difference between deterministic policy and a stochastic policy. A value function, a state value function in particular, is a prediction of future reward. It's used to evaluate the goodness or badness of states. Remember, we are talking about state value functions, not action value functions or, and not uh, state action value functions. So a, it can be represented simply with the equation provided in the slide. The value of a state S at given a policy pi, assuming that your agent follows the policy pi, is the expected cumulative reward. Uh, what's expected with this E sign here? This represents expectation, and expectation is essentially weighted average. You can look it up. It's a simple statistical operator, uh, and all it means is weighted average. Expected cumulative reward given policy pi if state ST or the initial state is S. We'll go into more details of this in the next lecture, but for now let's assume that it tells us what would be the maximum reward possible or the reward possible if you follow policy pi through the time horizon starting from state S. Model. The model predicts what the environment will do next. Remember the concept of uh, transition probability or the dynamics or the physics of the environment? This is what the model tells you. The model predicts the next state, or P predicts the next state, if you are in state S and you perform action A, what is the probability of getting to a state S prime? That's what transition probability or P predicts for you. And R predicts a next immediate reward. What is going to be, this is a predictive perspective, what is going to be the obtained reward if I take action A in state S, getting to a state, to some state S prime. So a model is a combination of transition probability prediction P and immediate reward prediction R. Another important uh, discussion in RL is the difference between learning and planning. I believe that in the first lecture of this course, uh, Dr. Shu has given you a description of planning problems within machine learning. So a planning problem is where you have a model of the environment. You know the P and R, you know the transition probabilities, and you know the reward predictions. Then the agent performs computations with its model without any external interaction. There is no need for the agent to interact with the environment to learn about the model. Uh, it already knows the model, so it has to find a trajectory within that model and states to improve its policy. Examples are deliberation, reasoning, introspection, pondering, thought search. So what we do in our brain when we want to decide what to do in a certain state is planning. We have an estimate of the model of the environment. Like when we want to play chess, we know the rules of chess. We know and we have an estimate of what the uh, opponent is going to do or what can happen next. 
And what we do in our brain when we decide or trying to decide what to do next is planning. But in reinforcement learning, the environment is initially unknown. We don't necessarily know the uh, transition probability, the dynamics, or the immediate reward signal or the function that produces immediate rewards. So the agent has to interact with the environment to learn about the dynamics, to learn about transition probabilities, to learn about rewards, and then based on its experiences in the world, the agent improves its policy. This is the difference between reinforcement learning and planning. So in reinforcement learning, the environment is initially unknown. In planning, a model of the environment is known. And remember, a model is uh, the tuple of P and R, transition probabilities and instantaneous rewards. So now that we know that the agent, an RL agent, has to interact with the environment to learn about uh, how to best act in that environment, we have to talk about exploration versus exploitation. Reinforcement learning in the very beginning is like trial and error. So at the very beginning of an RL training process, the RL agent doesn't know anything about the environment. It has a high-level objective that it has to maximize towards, but it doesn't know how to do that. It doesn't know how the environment works. Like when uh, a deep RL, a DQN agent, which we'll talk about later, wants to learn how to play the game of Pong, it doesn't know the rules of Pong. It doesn't know what each control action results uh, or what changes in the state uh, of the environment results from taking a certain control action. It doesn't know what the relationship between rewards and actions and states is. So the agent should discover a good policy by through trial and error. This trial and error is called exploration. And the idea for a good exploration mechanism, not always doing random things, is to explore with decreasing randomness such that you don't lose too much reward along the way, uh, along the way while you're raining, learning how to interact with the environment. Exploration finds more information about the environment. You explore different... Uh, dynamics or reactions to your actions from the environment. And exploitation exploits known information to maximize. So we'll see in the game that we'll play towards the end of this lecture, you can, when you learn what a certain control action results into, you'll use that knowledge to maximize, you'll exploit that knowledge to maximize receiving rewards. It is usually important to explore as well as exploit, but there's got to be some sort of balance between exploration and exploitation. You can't explore uh, all the way to the end of uh, the agent's life. So as I said, there's got to be a way to control how much randomness you implore and how or when do you exploit the information or the knowledge collected through exploration. This is a huge topic of research, and this is a very well-known problem within the RL domain. We'll talk more about this in the future lectures. Some examples of exploration and exploitation, like uh, restaurant selection is a good example. Exploitation is when you don't want to try something new and you just go to your favorite restaurant. Exploration is trying a new restaurant. Like when I first came to Manhattan, I knew Burger King, uh, McDonald's, or Texas Roadhouse, places like that. But uh, if I wanted to find a better restaurant or if I wanted to explore a new food, I would try a new restaurant. That's exploration within the space of uh, finding a restaurant problem. Uh, another good example is oil drilling. So oil companies or uh, this uh, oil drilling companies 
usually explore the seabed or uh, wherever else that there may be oil to find a good uh, reservoir of oil. They drill at different locations until they find a good place to put a permanent uh, drilling station on. Exploitation is to drill at the best known location, like through geological uh, analysis and uh, through satellite imaging and things like that. They found out where the best location is or the best known location is. And that's where they set camp and drill over there. And there are different examples of exploration and exploitation. Uh, you can think about uh, examples of your own, like navigating in a new environment can also be a good example of exploration and exploitation. I want you to think about how the balance between exploration and exploitation develops when you move into a new environment, like when you move to Manhattan, and you want to learn how to navigate from your home to the department and other places on campus and uh, so on. Now let's categorize RL agents. We talked about the general objective of RL, maximizing cumulative reward. So intuitively, we think that the only way to do that is to learn, a, learn an optimal policy function. Learn the policy function that tells us the best action to take given a new state. Uh, that kind of reinforcement learning is called policy-based reinforcement learning. But it's not the only way you can go about solving an RL problem or training an RL agent. Another way is to forget about explicitly optimizing the policy function and capturing it implicitly within value functions. So value iteration or value-based RL agents try to optimize the value function, either the state value function or action value function or state action value function. Remember, we called it the Q function. So Q learning is a value-based uh, RL algorithm. There are policy-based uh, RL algorithms like policy iteration. We'll talk about those in the next lecture. And the third class in the same classification framework is actor critic, where you have one policy-based optimizer and one value-based optimizer. And we try to balance the two, they, those to compete with each other to get the best solution out. Another way to categorize RL agents is based on whether they use a model or not. So again, intuitively, we think that if we have a model of the environment, if we know the dynamics of the environment, and we know what the reward function is like, we are best off. We will be easily able to, uh, well, learn a, an optimal policy or learn what the best sequence of actions should be to a maximum cumulative reward. That's not the case. When you have a model or when you learn a model to interact with the environment, remember, if you have a model, you're solving a planning problem. If you don't have a model, but you learn a model of the environment, you learn the transition dynamics and uh, the reward function based on exploration, you are solving a model-based RL problem. But that's not the only way. You can go with a model-free approach, which doesn't necessarily have access to a model or doesn't learn a model of the environment throughout the training process. It's more like going with gut feelings. So when you play, uh, if you go to a casino and play roulette, you don't necessarily know the physics of the ball that goes around the environment or when you when the RL agent starts to play Pong, it doesn't necessarily have to learn the rules of Pong or the physics of uh, the ball movement or uh, the ball bouncing back from the paddle and such. It can go with a gut feeling approach like, hey, when the ball was coming down and I brought my paddle down also. 
with this certain speed at that certain time, then the ball bounced back and later on I won the game. I won the episode or the round of the game. This is model free reinforcement learning where the agent doesn't learn a explicit model of the environment. And remember, model is transition probability and reward function. So in general, this figure represents the agent taxonomy. We have value-based or policy-based uh, approaches. We have model-based and model-free approaches. And there are, of course, overlapping uh, algorithms or algorithms that fall within the overlap of two or more of these different classes. Now, let's play a game, an unknown game. So, this is a game for which we don't know the rules and we don't know what the reward function looks like. So this is an RL problem. All we know is that we can press numbers or keys one to six to perform actions. We don't know what those actions are, but we can learn that through exploration. So let's press one, nothing happened. Let's press two. Ah, oh, that blue square went to or moved to the left cell. Let's press two again. So two probably means move left. Let's press three. Ah, oh, it moved right. Let's move three again, right. So three probably means moving right. Let's press four. Nothing happened. Interesting. Let's pl press four again. Nothing happened again. So let's press three, then four. Ah, oh, nothing happened. What about five? Ah, oh, five is down then, probably. Let's give it another try. Down. So five is down. Do we know what up is? Since we have some background information about how these sort of games move, we know that if we have a left and we have a right and we have a down, there's probably going to be an up as well. But this is based on transferring our knowledge in other domains into this problem. We don't necessarily know that or the RL agent, typical RL agents, uh, don't have access to that information. So they have to explore more to learn that. But let's see, so five is down, four does nothing, three is right, two is left, and one is up. So why did, it, why did one not go up when we started? So remember when we started, we were here, and when we pressed one, nothing happened. It's because probably those black cells represent walls which we cannot move into or move past. So, just in the interest of time, I, as a human being, by transferring knowledge from other domains, assume that I somehow have to get this blue square to the blue circle. So, let's do that. I did uh, 3, 3 to go right, or was it, uh, yeah. And now I have to go down, which is 5. Okay, now I'm here. What can I do now? I received no reward signals. Let's explore a bit more. What happens if I press six? Huh, six gave me a plus one reward signal. Let's go, uh, let's explore a bit. So six probably means picking up the circle. Now, again, transferring knowledge from other domains or previous experiences, outside the domain of this particular game, I assume that maybe the objective of the game is to get that blue circle to the bigger blue square in the corner. So let's try to do that. Let's go down, down was five, five, and then right, three, three. Okay, I received a plus one, but the game is not over. There's one control that I haven't used yet, and that I believe is four. 
Let's see what happens when I press 4. Ha. Huh. And thus, I win the game. So, again, I have to emphasize on the fact that since RL agents don't have currently, the state of the art of RL agents don't have transferability of knowledge or don't have the capability to transfer knowledge from other domains, learning to solve this problem for them is going to take many, many more iterations or a lot more time, which is going to be spent on exploration. So the way we solved it was a lot faster than the fastest RL agents out there in the research or uh, their research literature. So let's go back to the lecture, lecture slides. Um, we're done with the material we wanted to cover for today. Next time, we're going to talk about how to solve MDPs, how to actually implement an RL agent. We're going to talk about exact and approximate solutions to MDPs or RL problems. We are going to introduce Bellman equation and dynamic programming and talk about how it relates to uh, solving MDPs. We talk about value iteration and policy iteration algorithms. We talk about Q learning as an instance of value iteration algorithms. And probably in the third lecture, we'll start uh, our discussion on deep reinforcement learning. So for next time, which is going to be Wednesday, uh, you have a reading assignment. It's from the book Reinforcement Learning, second edition from Sutton. It's available online and it's open source. Uh, at least the preprint is open source. If you Google Reinforcement Learning Sutton, the first link is going to be the latest preprint revision. I think the latest revision is from a week ago. It's live, it's, uh, well, the authors of that book are correcting errors right now, but the bone and the meat of the material is already there. And I expect you to study as much of the chapters one to three as possible before our next lecture on Wednesday. If you have any problems, my contact information should be on the first slide. My email is behzadan at gmail.com or behzadan at ksu.edu. Just shoot me your emails or you can post your questions on uh, the Canvas uh, website, Canvas module. Um, and I believe that's it. Thank you very much. And until next Wednesday.